I'd like to call this September meeting of the Bryan Board of Education to order. I'd like to start first with the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening to those who are watching on VMU and those who are in attendance tonight. I'd like to start with the roll call, please. Scott? Here. Sindra? Here. Tom? Here. Deborah? Here. Michael? Here. Okay. We'll move forward with the approval and signing of the regular um, August meeting minutes. I, if there are no corrections or changes, I will take a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you, Deb. Second. Thank you, Mike. Scott? Yes. Sindra? Yes. Tom? Yes. Deb? Yes. Mike? Yes. I'm not aware of any public participation, so we'll go straight into communications. Um, excited tonight, our student spotlight is the Bryan City School Technology Team. Hello, I'm Tony Malanga. Hello, I'm and we're part of the tech team at Brian. So what is the tech team? We're a group of students from grades 9 through 12 uh, coming from all technology backgrounds. Some of us have never touched a computer before, and some of us have been doing this for several years. We each take a period of our day, um, so we have five students, that, or six students that take approximately five periods of our day to help the students at Brian. So the responsibilities of the tech team. Uh, we're in charge of managing our parts inventory. Um, so we have the parts needed to repair computers. Um, we have to update our log for billing and for reference. The log, we have, yeah, administration actually takes what we say that's wrong with the computer and puts it into the billing log letter for the, for the student's parents. Uh, we have to keep our Chromebook fleet in working condition, um, and we help students and staff with technical issues, and then we keep our passwords confidential. So when the student has an issue, they first go to the library, and in the library in our school, the librarians figure out if they can fix the issue. If they can't fix the issue, it comes to us. <coughs> so the students fill out a support ticket like this that allows them to tell us what their issue is so we can get a better understanding of why this computer is in our possession. We also have our end of the log, um, which we're able to put in our findings of why the computer's not working and able to put in what we did to fix it and what parts we used to fix it so we can all keep it nice and organized for reference. So the benefits of the tech team. Um, we're given extra responsibilities compared to the regular student body. This is important because employers now are looking for soft skills, which are the skills that can't be taught. So we are being taught um, problem solving, work, that, work ethic, leadership, time management, dependability, all through this, um, which you don't normally get. And then we get real life experience with computers and our components. So many of us want to compute. Uh, pursue a field in computer science after The administration has a lot of benefits. Um, there's so many computers in our district that fail. The administration would not have time to fix all of them if it was just for them. Um, so we fix all of those Chromebooks that are malfunctioning. So it gives, leaves pressure on the administration. And we also Administrators also have the option of delegating tasks that are important, but not necessarily important to get done right away. So this would include, um, we have a computer lab at Brian that we have to keep up to date with software updates and all that. Benefits to the student body. Um, there's a quick and easy way for students to get their computer fixed. Um, we're able to be role models and examples of hardworking students. Uh, student tech team by the numbers, we have approximately 2,000 Chromebooks in our district. Um, 
that's a rough estimate based on the number of students we have in the district. There's probably a couple more we left we missed. Uh, we averaged about 893 computer repairs that we, <coughs> those are the ones that we get in our log, not the ones that we help during our uh, class period or any other. Um, we do a lot of computer repairs, uh, a lot, we tend to do a lot of screens and motherboards is what we tend to fix a lot of. Um, so this is a couple pictures. Uh, the first one is four of the six kids on our team and a couple pictures of our room. And we're gonna open it up to questions if you have any. How many years have you been doing this? I have been doing this for three years. And you have uh, members of the team from uh, ninth grade on up? Yes. 893 repairs a year. Yeah. And six of you, you're, you're working a lot every day. I'm not going to do quick math. It'd be slow math, but that's, that's a lot. Congratulations. Thank you for all that you do. The 893 number, for the number of computers we have, is that an unusual number? Is that a reasonable number? Uh, um, I guess thinking in terms of... 893 is the computer repairs, 2000 is the number that we have. Right. So, so as a percentage, I mean, is that an unusually high percentage? Of uh, computer repairs? Um, I there's, and it's, a lot of computers also come in multiple times for, like, screens get broken. So, I mean, when you have computers that are out to students, you expect a high number of damages to come back. Broken screens is the biggest issue? Mm -hmm. By far. Huh. Do you find that a lot of those 893 repairs are some of the same people over and over? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have a count that comes when, when we look at our log to see how many times that students come in. We've had people up in the eight or nine times that by the end of the year they're coming back. Oh. Are there certain times of the school year that you seem to be busier than others, or? In the beginning of the school year, we see a lot of computers. Um, Any time coming out of a break, you see a lot of computers, um, and then especially towards the end of the year, you also get a lot of computers broken computers. Hmm. Any other questions for our students? Thank you so much. Thank Both you very much. much. You have a great audience. We appreciate your time. <coughs> so, with computers on our mind right at the moment, next we'll go into our presentation about esports. So, you wanted to set up? Okay. Just a reminder, you guys are welcome to stay for the entire meeting, but you're also welcome to leave at any point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matthew Paul. I've been teaching the district for five years now, and um, I've been involved with a good number of things, uh, technology-wise, um, uh, drones to robotics, etc. And so, um, about a year ago, uh, a couple of students came up to me in my robotics class and like, Mr. Coleman, we like really like the programming aspect of this. Um, we really like video games. Is there like a way we can do like a video game technology course or a class where you learn to program and design video games from the ground up? And so we met as like a small team, uh, Mr. Rary and a few others, uh, Mr. Carnes as well, was there. We kind of talked over what that might look like. And it was a very big adventure, to say the least. Um, so then, towards the end of the year, last year, we got um, some communication from Napoleon uh, saying that they had um, uh, an esports team that was affiliated with their athletic department. And so, uh, of course, that spills into our student body, and they have the buzz about that too. And so we went and checked it out. We thought, this might be something that our students might be interested in. And uh, so then we went ahead and, and uh, we posted a survey and we wanted to kind of present this as a proposal uh, that we kind of get uh, on board with this eSports movement. Um, and uh, I, I think you've already seen like a, pr uh, a presentation, a basic presentation of some of the uh, pros and cons and the like, more pros 
uh, about this. So we're going to walk through very quickly, uh, very much similar material, but maybe a few extra details that might help you uh, make a decision on this. All right. Um, we'll just quickly define esports. It's, it's electronic sports. It's not just video gaming. All right. So this is just like any other typical sport you would think of. Like you know, if you think like basketball, you have five players. You try to pick those five players that would be. Uh, at a strategic advantage to play for you uh, on that court, um, and, and you're going to sub in people again strategically. Same idea is going to apply to here. Um, we're we're going to look at like what are our top playing uh, ability players, and we're going to put them uh, in competition against other schools, uh, just like you would any other sport. Uh, there's there are practices involved. There are video sessions, strat talking strategy. What went, what went good, what went wrong, and then learning from that uh, along the way. All right, so it's all about that teamwork, that communication, and that, 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 that uh, strategic thinking as well, as well as leadership. You need someone to kind of step up as a leader and kind of pull the team together and, and, and uh, uh, to have success. All right, so is there a genuine interest? Um, so I, I, I um, asked Mr. Rary if we could uh, send out um, a survey to students. We sent it out through email, and we know how students are with email, however, Within, uh, is this open for about 24 hours? And we got over uh, 140 responses uh, in 24 hours from our uh, student base. And uh, we give an option, you know, if you would like to play competitively on an esports team for high school, right? And um, out of these 149 responses, 44.3% uh, said yes, they'd like to do that. That's about 66 people or so out of the, uh, the 149. Uh, we have some people, 20. 20.8 percent, maybe. Not quite sure if they would like to like jump in as a, at a competitive level. And then, um, as expected, about 34.9 percent are not really that interested. And I think that kind of goes with the general um, uh, interest in video gaming. I, I think you see like about 70 percent of people, uh, on average, uh, are in video gaming, and, and 30 percent are not. So it kind of fell into what we thought would uh, would happen. All right. Um, so we had 66 students say yes, 31 say maybe, right? And if we were to um, uh, take those numbers and form a club or a sport uh, with those people, it would automatically become the largest uh, activity in the district uh, right away. Um, so we know that we have a lot of interest. And so uh, some benefits, immediate and long term, real quick, um, it can build student relationships and confidence for sure. Uh, provides a safe and social place for them to play because this, this has to be done like in the presence of a coach, has to be done on school uh, campus. Uh, as part of the league uh, rules, all right? Um, provides an outlet for students that we wouldn't normally see, you know, playing football, playing basketball, playing baseball, um, you know, those, those ones that slip through our fingers. Uh, we might want to somehow hook them into uh, school. This would be given an avenue to, you know, latch onto something that they can take pride in, and I think that inevitably is going to spill into the classroom as far as <coughs> they need to maintain certain grade levels to be part of the team. Um, and so if they're not there yet, they're going to work hard to, to get there. Uh, and we can also build in, uh, a lot of these esports teams build in like study sessions before they actually go to practice. Uh, so that way you have the additional just mentorship that happens with uh, not just student to student, but student to teacher or whoever might be managing the team. Um, breaks down barriers between different groups of students, encourages collaboration, uh, prepares them for that digital world that's surrounding them more and more. Uh, gives them rough lessons in real life like perseverance, teamwork, as well as decision making. Uh, you're not going to win all your battles. Um, and I think that's what some, a lesson that sometimes we lose um, by, you know, awarding 10th uh, place, 11th place, 12th place trophies. Um, you know, at some point, you have to uh, accept a loss and learn from it and move on. Um, it encourages uh, students to like, maintain good grades so they can participate, provide scholarship opportunities. Um, there are several. Um, Ohio, State, well, uh, Ohio State has added an uh, esports team uh, to their repertoire, as well as uh, you have Tiffin and Akron as well that also uh, have esports, so universities are, are getting on board with this and they're offering scholarships <coughs> to individuals to play. All right, and also uh, we have STEAM opportunities. We're talking about STEAM, trying to integrate that into our district all the time. Uh, there's also like video and uh, production and streaming of the matches. That can, that's, a, that's a whole avenue that our BCT program could latch on to. Coaching, game an analysis, looking at numbers, looking at statistics. Uh, web design, marketing, shout casting, graphic design, and so on. So there's a lot of other branches that this thing can work its way into, if, if, if allowed. All right, so um, uh, the earlier presentation I shared with you, we were kind of leaning towards play versus. I talked to a few people from eSports Ohio, um, and uh, I like it because uh, this league is developed by educators, and educators that are like in the gaming, but also into like you know providing their students with an opportunity to be included, be part of that district. 
Um, for Play Versus, it's a for-profit organization, and we're looking at $64 per player just to participate. Right, so I personally, I like I shy away from an organization that's going to try to pull profit from a high school um, uh, organization. Uh, Esports Ohio is not for profit. There are no league fees at this moment, so it's a zero cost to our our district. It's a zero cost to our players, um, and it's educator led. So uh, we have a, there's a bunch of coaches from uh, uh, surrounding school districts that are involved, as well as their board uh, uh, is made up of uh, educators around the state. Um, so why Esports Ohio? It's in its second year of high school at, um, competition, so we're getting in at the ground level, really. Uh, last, uh, last year was their alpha season, they're calling this fall their beta season, and then they'll actually go into competitive, like keeping track of scores officially, uh, this spring. So we'll be getting right in at the beginning of it. There are over 100 plus school districts that are going to look that are either part of this or working to be part of this. Um, and we already mentioned uh, universities and scholarships. Uh, if you, uh, these are all links, so I can show this presentation to you guys, but you can go to some of these links, like the, there are actually like millions of, er of earnings made by professional esports players every year. Um, and actually, um, one of the games that's part of this league, uh, League of Legends, uh, had 58 million viewers. Uh, that's more than the World Series, that's more than the NBA Finals, that's more than the Stanley Cup Finals. Which is, I mean, that's pretty amazing if you think about it. So Super Bowl still holds uh, <laughs> the number one position, all right. But but to just come out, you know, the next few uh, over the last few years and hop up into second place, that's that's telling you something. All right. So member schools in our area, uh, I thought it was a really cool map stuff that was on Esports Ohio, so I pulled it, right. So um, I already had, went in and I just said that we're looking at it. Um, that I might be looking to try to head this up, and so they gave me some information, and we just simply got our school in there. We're not, we don't have any players registered yet because we want to make sure that you know everyone's on board and we got the okay to do it. But um, but so they included us gracious, graciously. Uh, but you have Four County, Delta, you got Springfield, Liberty Center, Napoleon, of course, where we went and visited Otsego. So you know we are kind of on our own out here in the far northwest corner of Ohio, you know, so we have potential here to kind of lead the way when it comes to getting into esports, uh, along with Napoleon and Fort County, All right? Um, if the kind of zoom out a little bit, um, now the, the map that, this used to be only maybe 30 or 40 schools, now it's blue blossom to like maybe, I think, 70 schools altogether. Um, and uh, so you can see there's a good grouping around like the Cleveland area and so forth, a few in Columbus and whatnot, but um, it, it's growing. Um, uh, so numbers double from what it was last year. So, so pretty, um, it's pretty uh, exciting to say the least. So how do these seasons work? Um, fall season runs September, preseason week. We just missed that. Uh, we're now in week one of competition. So there's scheduling matches, matches going on right now as we speak. Um, it's going to run all the way up through October, and then they have semifinals week in November, and there's actually then, you actually will the only travel <coughs> to be uh, required would be if you make it into the finals, you travel to Tiffin University and get, gets hosted there in the, their eSports arena, and you compete there. Um, as far as like games that are played, um, League of Legends, Overwatch, uh, Rocket League, and Smash Brothers are the ones that this league has selected. The reason they choose those games is they, the league has decided that they will choose only titles that are teen or younger rated. They will not uh, go with uh, the um, mature content because they, they feel like that doesn't really, that's not really a, a place that they want to be. Uh, they think they can get, you can get, still get a good esports experience and League of Legends is like one of the, it's a, one of the top paying out uh, esports that there is at the collegiate level and professional level right now. So um, they're, kind of, they're kind of happy to kind of stick with that. There may be other games added, but again, they're going to keep that teen rating or younger. All right. Um, there's one varsity team in each game, one journey, junior varsity team in each game, and then you can have club teams that beyond that if you wish. It's kind of for the school district to decide that. We at least need a varsity team at the very least. Okay, um, this is a lot of information, but I just want to kind of run through it uh, quickly and then we can open up for questions. All right, um, for school league teams, you have to have one varsity team. If you have enough, tank, enough players to go J with a JV squad, you can do that too, but you have to also have like the number of players required for the game plus one as a sub. That's, that's mandatory. Um, in case someone can't make it, someone gets sick or whatever. These people who are subs also are required to be at every practice and also they're required to be there when you're actually having standing event, just like any athletic event. Um, so roster side, you can see how we can easily get up to like 30 to 35 players like right away just to have a single varsity team looking at. For League of Legends, it's five players. 
Uh, it's like a, it's a um, there's like three different routes you kind of move across the map through, and it's a team-based strategy game. Uh, but uh, so you have five players plus the one sub, so that's six just for a varsity team. Uh, Rocket League, you have three plus one, so four. So you have ten players there. Uh, Overwatch teams, we're we're not going to maybe do Overwatch this season, but we'll at least look at it. Uh, so we probably won't uh, field a team in Overwatch if we were to go that way. Uh, but Smash Brothers is uh, five players uh, with one sub, so uh, that's easy. Just for varsity alone, you'll have 16 players just to start out, at least. Uh, that would be on your roster, actively competing. Uh, practices, um, they recommend at least once a week in person for each title that they play. Professional esports leagues have their players play one sport, one game only to focus on. Um, uh, but it kind of depends again on you know your, the the um, uh, how many players you have and how many players can be committed uh, to to playing each week as to like how many players that you actually have and if they go if you have them spam more than one game or not. Uh, Tiffin University, just, I asked them like how often do they have their their players play? Uh, they they are asked to practice two and a half hours every day uh, to to uh, in order to uh, participate. All right, if we have tons of students interested, how do we know it, narrow it down? Um, you really sh you should um, narrow it down by games. So you schedule like uh, like an all-in, like we're gonna have a tryouts for League of Legends, everyone come in, we're gonna get you into slots, and we're gonna have you run through and compete. And then at the end, coaches can pull that data and look at stats, look at like how players performed, who was your best performing players, and then look at see, like fitting your team in that way, just like you would like a basketball tryout or a football tryout or whatever. Um, so if we still have a lot of numbers that remain, we can always set up a 1v1 bracket and narrow things down through process of elimination. Um, does that mean that those players couldn't try to you know, work their way back in? No. But it just means for that, that season, fall or spring, we'd be locked in on the roster for those teams. Will this interfere with other sports? That's another big question. Um, we try to assign uh, matchups uh, early in the week, and then it's up to the schools that are matched up to decide on a time. So if you have players that are like doing, doing dual sport, if you want to do it as a dual sport option, um, or, or, or keep it kind of separate as far as like club versus sport, um, we try to, they try to make it so that we can um, work around those other practice schedules. Um, in the event that we really can't, then it might be where that, that's where the sub jumps in. Um, you know, sub for that team or subs work and play on that team during that time. All right, and this really kind of allows for maximum flexibility, really. Um, can students compete in more than one game? They can. That, that's entirely up to us as a program. Um, but I, I would think that we want, would want to focus them on whatever their, their specialty is, happens to be. Um, and it's just because that mirrors what the professional esports teams do, if that's what they're looking to do later on. All right. Um, I had mentioned that the max uh, uh, rate, rating that will do is teen. That's suitable for age 13, age, students age 13 and up. Um, and again, they, pat, they decided on, on this because they want to make sure that it's age appropriate for high school level play as well as to be successful at the college level. So that's why we look at that. And so those are the, the four that the league has decided. Again, the links do take you to like, you know, describing the rules of play, gives you an example of competition. So uh, when this presentation list gets shared to you, you're more than welcome to click the links and check it out uh, if you are looking to do look, uh, check some of this stuff out uh, beforehand. All right, uh, what do we need as a district? Uh, we need at least like six computers. They recommend PCs, however, um, three of those four games, Overwatch is the one that I'm not sure about. Uh, I think Overwatch is PC or, or Linux only. Um, but the other ones will work on our on, on a Mac OS, all right? And so we already have like the computers in district. We can make use of our CAD lab or whatever, which would be more than enough horsepower to do what we need to do. All right, uh, student essentials. These are things that are optional that students could purchase themselves to bring in or maybe they already have. A gaming headset, uh, a license for the game. Uh, like for Rocket League, they'd have to get their own license for that, for that game. They would log in uh, through Steam on our computers and they log in with their account. Uh, usernames have to be school appropriate, of course. So if they have uh, a name that's not appropriate, they're, they're gonna have to go in and change that uh, before they can compete. Um, so, so there's that. Um, so there's a few things. League Legends is free. Um, and if they, you can purchase things in game, but they do not change the way the game plays. That way, it's a level playing field for everyone involved with that game. Um, optional gear like gaming chairs, key, gaming keyboards and mice, gaming mouse pads, uh, esports uniforms. Uh, I've already talked with uh, Bill's uh, locker room and, and Ryan Jinx there, and he's working on some judging some designs up just just as like a, uh, some prototypes that we can like have the team decide on. Uh, Trying to keep that local as that much as we can. 
All right. Uh, cost and budgeting. I, I just looked this up because I and the puzzle me together because I felt just in case we wanted, we're curious. Like, what if we wanted to just get a PC lab dedicated just for esports? What if we wanted at some point in the future to make an esports arena <coughs> for our district? Uh, if for, with nothing, uh, having nothing in district, then we're looking at probably between four to five grand uh, to set up. That would that would just be like the you know five to six uh, uh, gaming PCs. Uh, but we already have, uh, like as I mentioned, the stuff in the district. So at least startup costs, we're looking at basically like zero <laughs> to get going uh, on this. All right. Questions that you might have. <laughs> so Matt, do you just went with the the big map of the state of Ohio, yeah. lot, seventy some schools. Mm -hmm. You know, where there's no division one, division two. I mean, can you play anybody? Right How's now, that going to work? Right now. Yes, but this what they're doing this beta season is they're trying to establish conferences. They're trying to establish like uh, by re they're trying to do it by region. So okay. similar to what we would do like with cross <coughs> districting and stuff like that, or football and whatever. Uh, they're trying to go that route now. As far as like D one, D two, D three, I don't know if they're if they're leaning towards that or not. Um, uh, I would like to think that uh, we don't need to go there. Um, with esports, I think it's it's such a, a universally applicable type of experience that I would hope that we could just like do conferences by region. That way, you could do like um, a meetup for like a semifinal or something like that, and then that would then go to the finals in the future as more schools join up. Yeah. 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 How many years has this been going on now? Um, the Ohio esports this is in their second year. Okay. So uh, Play Versus has been around for several years. Um, Play Versus is, um, uh, has been is, is, um, affiliated with the uh, National Federation of High School uh, Athletics or Sports. And so um, they've been around a little bit longer. Um, again, uh, they're more for profit. They are more nationally uh, invested. And so um, uh, with the Esports e e Ohio a League being, again, built from the ground up here in Ohio, it just seems like a better fit for us to start out as well. Yeah. What what type of sports will they be doing? I mean, like football. But oh, as far as the games and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so League of Legends is more like a like a um, kind of like a uh, fantasy RPG slash strategy type of game. So uh, where you have three different routes to get from your where your base to the enemy's base. Oh. And you need to take out towers along your way to get there. Okay. And as you do, your team gets perks for doing that as you move along. So that's one one type of game. The other game uh, is Rocket League. It's like a three on three. Um, it's like soccer, but using driving cars around and knocking the ball around the, the arena, trying to score a goal. So it's 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 more more soccer oriented. Um, and then um, Smash Brothers Ultimate is like a, a fighting game, a straight up like Street Fighter game or whatever if you um, if you're familiar with with uh, that genre. And uh, so what they're trying to do as a league is trying to find um, games that fit different genres. Um, would there be like room for like uh, like a FIFA or a NCAA football or whatever? Uh, I know that the league's open to suggestions. It's just a matter of like making that all work. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What do you see as the need of coaches, advisors, ratio to number of students that Maybe even involved. Great question. All right, so I don't think I alone will be able to manage 60 some kids. <laughs> All right, because I have been warned that with, when we do open practice, which is like open to anybody who wants to come in and play the team or play with the team, you're looking at 30 to 60 kids that's going to show up and want to game um, and, and, you know, fit their best skills against each other. I think we're. I mean, if it grow, if it, if we see initially that it gets to that, I mean, I think at least two like co-coaches, you know, someone that can so so that way you can have if maybe like I have cross responsibilities, so those come first, and then I have my esports, and then we have this esports thing. That if we get this thing started, so it'd be nice to have one other person to be like, you know, we need a coach has to be there. That's like part of the rules. You can't have kids in the building with no supervision. Okay. Exactly. So at least two. Co coaches and then and in, you know anyone else that would want to you know on, you know volunteer and uh, you know help advise um, you know obviously that would be welcomed um, but you know if it, if it comes to the point where we just have too many you know um, too many chickens in the farm 
uh, we'll have to we'll have to come maybe limit how many we actually you know take care of, how many we actually have come and participate at any given time. To say sign up, you know, the people who are on the team they get first dibs, and then if we have open slots, we can have other people hop in and take those spots. What are the uh, skill sets, attributes that you see a program like this fostering development of? I think, um, well, working as a team is huge. I think um, appropriate conversation with others is another. Um, uh, we, we hear it in the hallway a lot, uh, and, and you know, I think at, at any district, um, you can hear what, how students talk to one another. And I think that esports is, and, and probably managed esports, is a way to encourage like proper conversation, especially if you have a difference of opinion, um, working out to a solution that works best for all involved. Um, uh, also, um, I think that uh, you know diversity, like trying to build that that uh, that diverse experience from people you wouldn't normally talk to, maybe, um, and and breaking down those barriers so that like you you feel comfortable approaching somebody uh, that you may not normally talk to uh, about you know whatever you have need to talk to them about. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the numbers. Do you see the the, the lion's share of those numbers coming from kids that don't participate in any of the other organized sports at this time, or are you gonna you gonna have some uh, bleed over of people playing, you know, football, soccer, right. whatever it might be? There, there yeah. are, um, the, I, there are. It's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag for sure. I would say, um, looking just glancing to the name list, I was able to pick out probably I think half of those 66 are people that are not really into any type of athletics here at the school. Okay. Um, the other half are. However, talking to a couple of those, I said, I said, well, what about, what if we, you know, there's two seasons, there's fall and spring, you know, would one of those seasons not con conflict as much as the other, depending on what you, what you play? Um, because we have some athletes that do just football, and that's it. We have some people that do track, and that's it. We have some that do all. Um, and, and, and that would be something we could definitely do to make it flexible for, for them. But I, do, I would say probably half of the people that said yes, they're interested, are ones that we really don't have a, you know, a, a name to. You know I mean, they don't really have um, an investment in athletics or extracurricular at this time. Okay. Yeah. Matt, the other question too, when you mentioned the seasons, is the fall season and the spring season just identical? So, so some that can't participate in the fall, they could try out in the spring? Absolutely. They don't, yeah. they don't continue on from the fall to continue advancing farther in the spring? There would be, uh, there would be a whole another round of, of tryouts. There okay. would, I mean, uh, and basically it, the season starts over. Right, if they've been playing for fall season though, the idea would be like they should be experienced, so they should fare well, sure. even if new competition comes in, you know, um, and again, it would be up to like the numbers. It would come down to like who performs the best. You know, that's just like you would. But fall season would end <coughs> with the championship. Yep. Spring season would start and have its championship. The way it's the way it's set up right now. That's the way it works. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yep. So with approximately 66 students that showed initial yes as an interest, mm -hmm. um, would we jump into a JV team as well? Because at the numbers, I'm, I counted 16. For varsity at amongst least, the yeah. three different games that could be played so now you're at 32 right yeah um, uh, I, th I think that we would based on the numbers again having a varsity in JV is based upon your the interest level of the district and the numbers that you can actually commit to practice and commit to playing on the on, you know when the matches are scheduled yeah, to be seen. yeah. So, so, and that's why they suggest like once you get some um, uh, interest and you have players coming in for practice or for open sessions, then you start, you know, tightening the, the parameters. Like you must show up at this time. This is when practice is going to happen, and you're going to have you're going to find those people who are dedicated. Um, so that in itself will narrow the numbers. You're, sure. you're going to you might have 66 people that are just like fair weather fans. You know, they show up when it's convenient for them, and then, you know, they like the game, but they're not really seriously into, involved, yeah. wanting to be part of this team. Um, but they just want to come and play every now and then. Um, but yeah, I think for sure we probably would have, based on the numbers, we would be feeling a, a varsity and a JV for most of these. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to need a feeling out process here, an opportunity to get into it and just see how things start to manifest themselves or flesh them flesh them out exactly right and i think that's kind of why the timing is actually kind of perfect because you know we we're trying to you know you know get this going before we can get and in, be involved with fall season however 
it would have been a nightmare trying to get everyone, all our ducks in a row, because they also have to, we have to have a parent meeting with, with them, a uh, parent uh, uh, athlete or uh, esports athlete meeting, where they have to, um, they're, made, they're made aware of the rules, the regulations of the league, they have to sign, there's some signings, some papers they have to sign out, we have to scan and fax those in or, or email them in. Uh, to the league as well. So there's a whole process beyond, you know, from saying, yes, we're going to do this to actually competing. Um, it, it is, there is a little bit of a, a trial by fire type of process, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions no. for Mr. Holland? Great presentation. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And you're going to send that to us. I know we got, a, I we sure got one version of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think will, there was um, some different. It's in PowerPoint, so if, is that going to be okay to yeah. send it PowerPoint wise your way? Okay, yeah. I will do that. Yep, no problem. That'd be great. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to the four county report. I do have a, a just a quick little report this evening. The school year that has started off very busy with 881 students. That was my report as of last month's board meeting, so that could have changed a little bit, but I think that's a good number. I know they always average around 400 students. The um, students have participated in many things, including Patriot Day ceremony for the veterans. Hopefully you saw that in the newspaper. We got some nice coverage for Fort County. The cosmetology salon will be opening October 4th. You can stop by or stop in or make an appointment. Um, with our cosmetology students um, they will be taking appointments and seeing people and offering their services Mondays and Fridays from 9 to 1. The Four Star Cafe is always fun if you've never been. It will be opening late October. I'll get a date um, soon. They serve delicious culinary concoctions by the culinary students Wednesday through Friday from 11 to 1. And new this year for the students, they now have a salad bar at cafeteria. I'm told that's been well received. So that's my four county report today. And I'm sorry, I will go back here to the agenda. Also, that's all right. It's not coming out. Well, looky there. Just when, you, just when you think you have it. Mike sees what's going on here. He sees things. I'm hitting the right buttons. It just pop ups. Tech team, I really am hitting the right buttons. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Okay. Is it working or not? Yeah. You know to help. It, it is. We're there. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Treasurer's report, I should have known. I've done this for a while. We'll move on to Mr. Schaefer. For All right, the thank you. Report. Thanks. We'll begin with our cash reconciliation report as of August 31st, 2019. In Farmers and Merchants Bank, we had $5,791,942.15 with outstanding checks and other adjustments of $293,153.73. In Star, Ohio, $927,396.63. UBS Financial, $4,322,782.68. State Bank, $6,391,570.37. Star, Ohio Plus, $2,474,475.39 for a total of investments of $14,116,000. $225.07. Petty cash and change funds amount to $7,400 for a total fund balance of $19,622,413.49. Major funds include the general fund with a balance of $14,793,378.51. The bond fund, $1,997,000. $859.32, and the Permanent Improvement Fund, $1,719,470.49. There are also uh, several other financial reports uh, available as Exhibit B uh, in your packet. Any questions on any of those reports? Now we'll move on to the final appropriations for the uh, fiscal 2020 year. 
Uh, total appropriations for the year $28,274,184.80. Uh, notable changes from our temporary uh, appropriations an increase in the general fund of $48,323.74, uh, an increase to the food service fund $15,350, uh, public school support of the principal's fund $7,000, district managed activities $11,702.77, uh, decreases in appropriations in both federal grants and auxiliary funds uh, $15,654.68 and $9,815.93 and ninety-three respectively. That has to do with the closing out of the fiscal 2019 year. Uh, an increase in the permanent improvement appropriations of $35,221.16 for an additional curriculum item and equipment owing to the establishment of a new classroom. Total changes in appropriations from the temporary appropriations, $92,127.06. Any questions on that? Uh, we ask your permission to establish Fund 467, the Student Wellness and Success Fund. This uh, fund is the fund that has been designated by the Auditor of State to receive the funds um, being sent to us through the new state budget for Student Wellness and Success. We also uh, request your approval to advance funds from the general fund to the cafeteria fund, $15,000 to cover purchases made in advance uh, for this school year. And finally, we would like to acknowledge and thank uh, following donations, $100 from Gregory and Mary Spangler for the class of 2023, $125 matching grant from Your Cause for the Side Daily Scholarship, and $200 from the Bryan Area Business Women for unpaid school lunches. Are there any questions about the treasurer's report? <coughs> now I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you, Tom. Second. second. Thank you, Mike. Cinder? Yes. Tom? Yes. Deb? Yes. Mike? Yes. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to old business. Tennis court update? Yep, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Savage slip in here with his tennis court update and then we can save the rest of your report for later. Uh, tennis court update, we should see some things happen here in the next two weeks, major changes, such as landscaping around the perimeter of the tennis courts, um, drainage tying in from the tennis courts to right there inside the, the football court fence in area. The fencing around the outside of the tennis courts should be taken place. Um, the surface itself should be should be happening. The net posts, the courts outlined, and also the, the courts painted here. <coughs> Weather permitting, we should have a lot of that taking place in the next two weeks, maybe two and a half weeks. Hopefully by next time okay. we meet. I believe. Next time we meet, it should be uh, playable. Not going to lie. That's where we're at. Thanks, Any Jack. questions? Any questions about that? Still hoping to see some play there then? Uh, the, the girls are still holding out hope for that August 1st is the last October schedule. 1st. I'm sorry. Yeah, October 1st. Their, their last home match on the schedule. They're still hoping that they can they get into okay. your home. Keeping our fingers crossed then. Yeah, yes, we are. There too, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on with the <coughs> superintendent's recommendations. Thank you. Under administrative recommendations, first of all, you have an agreement with the hospital in Fountain City Christian School. Um, this is a service agreement. Um, Chad Bassett helps facilitate this. Um, it's with their auxiliary funds, which is the reason that you're approving it for this evening. Next, you're going to see a list of textbooks that are currently being used in our curriculums for both the Bryan Elementary in the Bryan Middle School High School. Um, an oversight on our part uh, that we should have brought this to you on a more annual basis and we will do so in the future, but we wanted to get everything caught up. Um, we did have a new math curriculum at the elementary level, which is Ready Math, um, and this represents <coughs> only textbooks, like hard, regular textbooks. So there's a lot of the curriculum that is electronic, uh, that is hands-on uh, activities and experiments that are not listed here that are supplementing as well. 
And those are my administrative recommendations. Any questions for Mrs. Savage? If not, I will take a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you, Deb. Second? Second. Thank you, Mike. Tom? Yes. Deb? Yes. Mike? Yes. Scott? Yes. Sindra? Yes. Thank you. Under personnel recommendations, um, under classified staff adjustments, we have Aubra Dixon, educational aid, 7.5 hours per day, effective August 26th. Jen Andrews, educational aid, 7.25 hours per day, effective 9-3. And that's just due mainly to some bus route, um, getting a little closer on what the bus routes are actually taken. I'm going to go to the addendum as well. And we have one more adjustment, Kathleen Ottenweller, um, going from a one-on-one -on -one to a one-on-two aid. This is an ESSA certified position, 5.75 hours per day, and that was effective <coughs> September 10th. Under classified resignations, we have Linda Blagu, um, 6 to 12 educational aid, and that was effective August 26th. Recommending new hires, Amanda Romez as a 6 to 12 server, three and a half hours per day. Zero years experience, effective August 26th. Emily Keller, our last, one of our last open positions at the elementary for preschool. This is an ESSA certified position. Five hours per day, Tuesday through Friday. Zero years experience, effective September 4th. And then one of our final um, high school positions, Velvet Phase, six to 12, five hours per day, zero years experience, effective September 10th. We'd also like to approve as classified substitutes the list that you see in front of you. And then moving on to our certified staff, we have Megan Lytle Steele moving on the salary schedule to Masters Plus 20. That would go effective August 14th. Three substitutes for our certified um, class and then a supplemental contract for the 1920 school year for Laura Knight as choir accompanist paid at tutor rate effective August 14th. Are there any questions regarding those personnel recommendations? <coughs> if not, I'll take a recommendation or a motion to approve the personnel recommendations. So moved. Thanks, Tom. Second. Thanks, Mike. Deb. Yes. Mike? Yes. Scott? Yes. Sindra? Yes. Tom? Yes. Thank you. Okay, under legislative finance update, I would like to go back to something that Kevin mentioned um, in his recommendations about the Student Wellness and Success Fund. So, uh, Kevin, I attended a session last week and, and got some more information, and Kevin and I have talked, um, we've talked with Chad Bassett as well. So initially, when the initial reports came out in the biennium budget, remember we said that more details will come as time goes on and as we have these sessions, we'll learn more and more. So one thing that we learned last week is our funding and the money that we're getting in the student wellness is around $500,000 for this year and around $1.4 total for the biennium budget. Now that money can be used and is to be used to promote student health and wellness, mental health, supports. Um, it can be used for capital projects, so bricks and mortar, equipment, technology. Um, it can be also used, which is different from the stimulus money we got about five to six years ago. It can be used to help support what we're already doing in Bryan City Schools, um, you have to partner with a community partner um, in the planning process of this. So that can be your ESC, that could be um, uh, the Adams Board, that could be a Renewed Mind, which we already have a partnership with. Uh, it could be with our juvenile court system, possibly with our city, they weren't on the list. We can also use the money for school safety so like our SRO program. So what Kevin and I and Chad are going to do over the next few weeks, they stressed at this meeting that the most important part is you don't have to spend the money this year, but you have to have your plan in place. So I met with a group of staff members this morning and just asked them to start small and dream big, 
just help prioritize the needs of the district. We're going to do the same with the administrative staff. We're going to do the same with some, some teaching groups and other staff members just to get some ideas of where our priorities should be. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about that with the board as we continue down this process. But um, it is good news for our district. It is a significant amount of money that can be used to help support our vision. I will tell you that I truly believe that this district has taken steps on its own over the past five years. Um, so many of the plans that other school districts are looking at are adding social workers, um, developing those partnerships to get school-based mental health services, things that we have already put in place on our own. Um, so again, the question will come down to what is the best use of these funds to help us reach our long-term mission? Is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I don't think so. Any questions from the board members on hearing that? at this time other than that's great we'll have that at our resources to yeah. help students yeah and it has to be focused <coughs> on students mm -hmm. the plan has to, to be focused on students look forward mm -hmm. to that plan Super. okay so also we have some board meeting dates our next board meeting will be october 21st here in the boardroom our lpdc did set a meeting date for november 12th and our business advisory committee will meet October 15th at 7 a.m. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to our administrators and we'll start with Mr. Savage and a report in our athletics. Yep. Uh, just coming from junior high volleyball tonight. So their record is now seventh grade loss to the Hilltop in three. So they're four and three. Eighth grade volleyball defeated Hilltop in two. So they're four and three overall. Junior High Cross Country, I know they just were coming back from deploying tonight. Um, this, this past weekend at the Out of Glendorf Invitational, the boys were 19th out of 21, the girls were third. And I know the girls were really excited to come to the volleyball tonight. They, they won tonight and made, I think, five of the top seven runners coming in tonight. Did very well. Uh, junior High Football, seventh grade is 0 and 2 right now. We people had one game because one didn't have a team last week. They, they've had one game. They both played this Thursday at Wasion for eighth grade and seventh grade is home. Um, high school cross country, the Auto Blend Riff invite this past weekend. The boys were ninth out of 19, and we had one boy that came in first overall, and the girls were 11th out of 16. And we had, I think, our top finisher on the girls' side was, was fifth. Uh, football, the varsity team is 1 and 2 overall, the JV is 2 and 1. The freshmen will have their first game this coming, or week from tonight, at Wasion. Golf is 4 and 1 in the league, and they were second at the Golden Bear Invitational this past weekend over in Stryker. The boys' soccer team is is at 4-0-5 right now. Just one thing so far is just time is just, we have our fair share of ties at this point. So they're 4-0-5, they're sitting at, I believe, 2-0-1 in the league. Um, the girls' soccer is 2-4-2, two, two. they're on a two-game winning streak. The tennis team is 12-1 as they are off tonight. They play their state team match tomorrow at Lima Central Catholic. Um, the volleyball team, the varsity team is 7-3 overall. They're 3-0 in the league, and they have a big match at Lausanne tomorrow. JV is about 500, they told me, so around 4-4. Four four. Freshman <coughs> is 1-6. Some key dates coming up for us over the next month or so. The league golf meet is already here. It's this Friday in Defiance at Auglaize Golf Course, or Country Club in Defiance, September 20th at 9 o'clock, they tee off. The Athletic Boosters will have the reverse raffle on Saturday, September 28th at the Buffalo Road Reception Hall. The dinner's at 5.30, the raffle's at 7. And we're going to host the lead cross country meet for the first time in nine years. That's on Saturday, October 12th in Bryan Rec Park. The junior high will run at 11.30. The high school will run, will run at 10 o'clock. We're going to talk about the tennis court update. So questions for me pertain to athletics. Good report. I appreciate the... Um yeah, thank information you. so we can see it in front. Any questions? Thank you. Mr. Bassett. <coughs> um, my report tonight centers around a school report card that was released this week. Um, so I'd like to just go through that. I had some more statewide statistics that I had a chance to break down and look at today, which I think is, is helpful. 
um, when we compare ourselves. So overall, our district um, was a C. If you look at ODE, that says proficient. You know, sometimes in school, we only see just average for the state of Ohio. C is proficient or expected. Um, is what it's supposed to be. If you look at the, the scores across the state, it is pretty much a bell curve, but the bulk of the schools right there in the middle. Um, you look at some of our similar districts in size and demographics, they're all pretty much a C, um, right where they're at. Um, achievement, if you look at achievement component of that, makes up 20% of your total grade. Um, you look at indicators met in that, and we're an F in indicators met, we're D for achievement. I looked into the indicators met a little bit because I want to see, you know, Let's get some guidance here on how those districts are doing. My rough estimate today was 71% of the districts in the state of Ohio were in F indicators met too. So we're really kind of battling, I don't know, a really uphill climb there. And that's 80% of your students passing these tests. You know, we have some 77s, some 78s, some 76. You're going to 80. It's just an X. It's it's the pass it. It's, it's not a a curve or anything like that. It's just flat 80%. Um, progress, again, we're D. Progress is our value add. I've been telling you this for three years and, and still we're in the third year of that. We are still getting zeros for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade at the elementary because the middle school IRN is attached to that elementary building. So really, we're getting scores for fourth and fifth grade there, but they're saying you need scores for sixth, seventh, and eight. We don't have any from three years ago, so that's a zero. That really hurts us when you're dividing that out. Um, just one of those things that we think next year that will that'll work itself out. Um, gap closing, looking at most vulnerable populations that we have, you know, special needs, our goal is 20%, our socioeconomic status, we're B there. It's where we've been about. Um, we're doing a good job of servicing those kids and we have a relatively high number. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of that, that we are reaching those kids. Graduation rate, we're <coughs> continue to graduate kids, um, what we're supposed to do. Proving at-risk K-3 readers um, is a D or a C last year. We addressed an issue with this, we believe, in about January or February of last year that we think is going to reflect next year. Um, it's a way, just kind of the way we were doing things, um, that we caught something, and we think that's going to be come way up next year is our hope. Um, last year, you catch it, you know, it's too late. Um, so anyway, prepare for success. This one really bothers me because when you go to the interview day, <coughs> and you, saw it, um, you know, we have all the businesses come in and interview our kids. They're always raving about our kids. Your kids are so great. They're prepared. They're, they're, they interview very well. And I'm saying, but we're, we're a D here. Um, you look at that, it's two years old data. So we're back to 2016. They track it back that far. But if you look across the state, 82% of the school districts in the state of Ohio were a year after this category. So really only 18% of our schools are proficient or above in this. Um, again, kind of, kind of just depressing. If I think we're producing a good product, but the state, by the state measurements, they're saying we're, we're a D there. That's, that's remediation free, a college ACT, enrolled in college in two to four years, or an industry recognized credential. So you really get no credit there for the student that you've graduated, that's worked hard, <coughs> and then go right into the workforce. The state's not recognizing that as prepared, um, which is frustrating because we have some, some very productive citizens that, that are going that way. So. Questions on the report card there, I quickly went through that. As Mary said, it doesn't tell the whole story. Of the Absolutely. History. You know, the state superintendent, he had a statement when he was the report card release saying, this is one measurement, go to your individual school district, ask questions. Um, to figure out what is really going on, besides just you know, most of these are based on on a test. We have a, an amazing system here, amazing teachers and administrators, and I think so. our students are very fortunate to be in this district, in my opinion. Um, that means nothing. It does, but it doesn't. Yeah, it we, just, we, it's not a fair evaluation, and we all know it. it's been this way for years. So, so. <coughs> not a fair evaluation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pinch hit for Mrs. Cox today. Um, as I said, she is at the junior high cross-country meet and wasn't sure if she would make it back in time. So 
We want to share that the Bryan Elementary um, is being recognized by the Ohio Department of Education for its PBIS, which is Positive Behavior Intervention Support Team. And they received the highest award they could, which was a bronze. And they've also been asked to present in Columbus in December. So we have a team together that will be traveling to Columbus. We also have been asked to present locally in Toledo. So we have another team that's going to travel to Toledo to present on our PBIS program. So congratulations to um, our elementary school and good luck to our presenters and you know, possibly down the road we could have them as one of our um, spotlights to, to do that presentation. Bryan Elementary and Bryan Middle School High School will have Constitution Day on Tuesday, September 17th. Um, again, ODE rec highly recommends that we have some uh, curriculum that is devoted to the Constitution on that date. Our school safety drill is coming up on Monday, September 23rd, and parents will get an instant alert regarding that. A reminder that this year, Bryan Elementary is switching to trimesters for their grading, so progress reports for students will be going home Monday, September 30th. And then finally, Bryan City Schools are going to participate in National Walk Bike to School Day on Wednesday, October 2nd. Uh, students are encouraged to bike or walk to school on this day, and it's built, <coughs> it's celebrated in October to create an opportunity for schools to join together and celebrate the energy of National Bike Month. And along that lines, we are partnering with the City of Bryan to do a study on how students are getting to school and we're collecting that data right now, um, which will help us apply for grant funding uh, to ad add some more safety um, issues. So, Mr. Rary, I hope I didn't steal all your thunder with that. No, that's okay. That. I was going to say I actually got a thin list here because a lot okay. of the same stuff <laughs> was talked about you know, I just kind of felt you checking things curriculum off and Mrs. There. Cox with uh, the elementary. So. I'll just echo, echo what Cinder said. We have awesome stuff happening inside our, our walls every day. So, I mean, this is just one of the many things that we had going on here. So, it's great to see them in action and, and showcasing that. So, um, it's midterm next week already. So, we're about halfway through the first quarter. So, with that uh, does come the arrival of homecoming usually. So, homecoming's on the horizon here. Uh, that's the, well, September 30th. The, the last week of September slash first week of October is when that kicks off. So. We're bringing back a bonfire this year for students in grades 9 through 12. We're just going to host it across the street here at the church. So we thank them for their hospitality and allowing us to um, burn some pallets over there and have some fun. And our students are going to take part in some grade level uh, games, um, ultimate frisbee, and uh, form some teams and, and have a little fun that night. And then throughout the week is the annual float building. So you'll see those displayed uh, Friday morning as you pull in. Uh, the homecoming Friday as you pull into our campus, those will be on display. Hopefully the weather holds out and everyone can see all the, the great work that <coughs> students always do on those. And then we have our fun pep assemblies that homecoming Friday with the game Friday night. So we're looking, looking forward to all the homecoming festivities. Um, as mentioned, we actually have one of our one of three required safety drills coming up in our building. Ours is tomorrow, actually. So we've been working with our school resource officers and are looking forward to putting our students through a scenario that is unknown to them and to the staff actually to our admin team and the school resource officers themselves. No one knows the, uh, the, uh, um, the plan, so they have to respond appropriately and put their, their training to the test. So afterwards, we always do a debriefing with the students and the staff and allow the students to ask a lot of questions and we give them feedback and our resource officers walk around and pop into classrooms and give them some answers that they're looking for. So that's tomorrow. And then uh, at the beginning of October, we also have uh, Ready, Set, Relax. Um, if you know Brad Hurtig, or if uh, you're familiar with the CAF team uh, that represents here in town, uh, we have a great speaker on the way that's going to speak to all of our students on the 7th about overcoming overcoming challenges. So we're really looking forward to what he has to bring to us. So okay. A lot of Thank good you. things still happening. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> okay. Well, I appreciate everyone that's here this evening and those who have watched. We do have a reason to go into executive session. Or C, conference with the board's attorney discuss matters which are subject to pending of um, imminent court action. And D, preparing for conducting review and negotiation bargaining session with employees. I do not expect any um, um, any actions taken. Um, and we appreciate your time. I'll take a motion to move into executive session. 
So moved. Thank you, Deb. Second. Thank you, Scott. Mike? Yes. Scott? Yes. Sandra? Yes. Tom? Yes. Deb? Yes. Thank you.